welcome. Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. How has your week been? Well, I hope and trust that you have had a good week. And if you've had a challenging week, I know that you will still be able to testify that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. We know that whenever we go through challenging times, it's an opportunity for our faith and our trust in God to be stretched, to be challenged, to be solidified, and to put everything that we have learned week after week when we have these messages and our services is to put them into practice when we go through our challenging times. And so I can testify that yes, God is good and I give God thanks that we've come to the end of the first month of this year, which is always a long month, um, but we can end this month in praise to God. So let us join Hope Sabbath School right now as we go into our Sabbath School lesson. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. We are enjoying a series on Isaiah the Gospel Prophet. Today, the Noble Prince of Peace, one of my favorite chapters. So welcome to Hope Sabbath School. We're glad you're with us and welcome to the team. Now I call you the Gideon's Band. You know the story of Gideon started out with what? 10,000 went to, no, 32,000, then to 10,000, and then to 300. Well, we've gone from 12 to five. Take a look at our Gideon's Band. That's because of the social distancing restrictions, but we're still experiencing a powerful study. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. And we know that many of you where you are are also restricted, but the gospel is not hindered. Amen? Amen? Amen. God is speaking to us even in our homes. Maybe some of our churches are still not open, but this series on the gospel prophet Isaiah is such a blessing. And we have something special for you during this series. We are offering a digital download of an audio book called Radical Evidence. If you would like to hear radical evidence from the scriptures, including Isaiah, of Jesus as the true Messiah, plus powerful stories today, all you have to do is write to us at our regular address, sshope at hopetv.org, and in the subject line, just say free offer, okay? SSHope, hopetv.org, free offer. We'll send you a link so you can download that audiobook. It is so powerful. I wish I could send one to everyone, but it would cost a fortune. But we can mm -hmm. deliver it to you at no cost, and you can even share it with your friends. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the study of your word today the noble Prince of Peace, so much about the coming Messiah who now has already come, Jesus. Mm. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I pray that as we study today from this ancient book, that Jesus would be seen in all of his power to save and that lives would be changed. Yes, that darkness would be dispelled by the light of the world Amen. is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, this is one of my favorite chapters in the whole book. Uh, Isaiah, the gospel prophet, is really an amazing book. But chapter 9, where we're going to study today, uh, actually the title, Noble Prince of Peace, that's just one of the titles that he's given in the chapter. Yes. So let's start in chapter 9. And Jason, if you could begin our study with verses 1 and 2 of Isaiah chapter 9. And I have here the New King James Version. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So this is a prophecy, and by the way, if, if you missed part of our study, 
Isaiah tells us that God, the true God, knows the end from the beginning. Yes. So he can tell the prophet what's going to happen, right? Yes. So this is a prophecy. So here's my question, Billy. Who is the great light that Isaiah is talking about? Jesus. Jesus is the great light. Yes. In fact, we're going to look at some passages that will confirm that. First, a prophecy when Jesus was still a, a tiny baby mm -hmm. in Luke chapter 2. The Holy Spirit rested upon someone. Stephanie, if you could look in Luke 2. Who was this person that the Spirit of God rested upon and he prophesied about this light that had been foretold 700 years earlier? We're All in Luke right. chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. All right, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So what clues do you see in the passage that, that Simeon is a prophet? What, what clues do you see? The Holy Spirit is upon him. The Holy Spirit was upon him? What else? It was revealed to him by the Spirit? He came by the Spirit into the temple? I mean, yes. Yes. did you get it? Yes, Billy. And I think the, the language that he was using, like a light to bring revelation to, I'm reading from the King James Version, yes. but um, he's basically repeating the same thing that we just read in Isaiah 9. <laughs> he's okay. quoting the Scriptures, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which would make sense because he's speaking by the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's repeating the prophecy given 700 years mm -hmm. earlier. Now, think about uh, especially the Gospel of John. Stephanie? I didn't want to pass over it. It says that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Right. So he mm -hmm. was looking yeah. for that uh, fulfillment of the prophecy. So maybe we'd miss it if we're not looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. He's looking with a prayer in his heart and the Spirit of the Lord is with him. Mm -hmm. All right? Yes. Scan through your, your knowledge of the book of John particularly. Uh, references to Jesus as the light of the world. Christian? You know, I, I, a reference that comes to mind is not only a reference, but it's actually a claim that Jesus himself made. You're thinking um, of uh, John chapter John 8? John chapter 8. Would you read that for us, John sure. 8 and verse 12? Uh, John chapter 8, verse 12. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And Jesus said or spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm the light of the world. Yes. And you remember right at the beginning of John's Gospel, Lisa, mm -hmm. could you read those first few verses? You remember it says in the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. but it also says something about light. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, John 1, 1 to 5. 1 to 4, please. Thank you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Ah. In him was what? Life. life. And the life was the? Light. light. Light of men. Now, you say, well, you know, anybody can claim to be the light of the world, but Matthew testifies under the Holy Spirit's inspiration that Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Mm -hmm. Billy, could you take us to Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 17? And he actually quotes that ancient prophecy. Now we're learning something here, aren't we? We're learning that these men and women of God through the ages, they took the scriptures seriously mm -hmm. because they didn't have access to all of these 
Bibles that we have. There were scrolls, but most of them had to mm. memorize what was in the sacred scriptures and read to them. Mm. Let's see what Matthew says in Matthew 4, verses 12 to 17. Sure, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the G Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. Mm. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to, and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of the heaven is at hand. Notice that the inspired uh, text of the New Testament says, that inspired text of the Old Testament mm. is talking about Jesus. Mm. Yes. He's the light of yes. the world. You know, sometimes people say, well, you can't, you can't tell what's going to happen 700 years. In. That would be a coincidence mm. if that happened. But the no. gospel prophets say, no, as it was written by the prophet, Mm -hmm. A yes. virgin shall conceive. Or as it was written, in, you in Galilee, you yes. know, you'll see a great light. Mm -hmm. So I think there's confidence, isn't there? Yeah. Of course, yes. Jesus also believed that those scriptures were pointing to him. He said, these are they that testify, testify of me, me. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is really exciting as we see these prophecies about Messiah. Now, before we go on in chapter 9, I'm excited because the darkness that Jesus dispels mm -hmm. isn't just back then. That's isn't that yes. right, Lisa? Yes. Mm -hmm. That darkness is dispelled now. Mm -hmm. In yes. fact, some of us, maybe all of us, have had darkness dispelled from our lives. Is that yes. right? Yes. yes. And certainly people watching, you're watching Hope Sabbath School today, you say, Derek, I know what that means. I, I know what it's like to live in darkness. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, the light of the world, dispelled the darkness. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Amen. So what is the appropriate way to respond to the fact that the light of the world has dispelled our darkness. Well, there's a text. Where is it found? Stephanie, Peter, do you remember? Yes, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Would you read it for us? Sure. You probably have memorized it, but it's a beautiful text. And I think it, it's not only a description, but it's a, it's a challenge to us mm. as well. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hmm. So what's an appropriate response? Proclaim, proclaim. praises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not proclaim our praises, right? His praises. His praises. His praises. Yes. yes. Who called us out of darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, I think in a testimony, it's okay to say, you know, I, I struggle with a lot of sin. I don't want to focus on all of that. Mm -mm. I want to praise the one who delivered me, right? Yeah. Yeah. He called me out of darkness. Now I'm looking at this wonderful group of uh, godly Enoch men and women, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know, has, has, has God had to deliver you out of darkness at any point? Does anybody have a testimony that you could share where you would say, you know, there was a dark time in my life, and, and, and Jesus, the light of the world, dispelled that darkness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Yes, Christian. You know, I, I grew up as a, as a PK. You know, and that PK, means a pastor's... That means a pastor's kid. Okay. Right? Yeah. And um, so for the first 18 years of my life, you know, I, I lived, you know, under the shadow of my father as the pastor, you know. Mm. And, um, and, and so throughout, you know, my, my er childhood, um, going to church was, you know, was something that, uh, that was quite... Um, you know, interesting because because I had that identity as being a part of the pastor's family. Mm. Well, fast forward now to to when I finished my senior year in high school, and uh, and I I went to Southern Adventist University in Tennessee, and my parents were at the time missionaries in the Philippines. Mm. Long way away. Long way away. And so when they took me to the campus of Southern and dropped mm. me off, uh, and left me there. This would be the first time that I would be apart from my mom and dad, okay? 
And I can't explain it um, in words, but I can tell you this, that I had a type of, of identity crisis, if you want to put it that way, mm. if only because I was no longer the PK. Mm -hmm. You know, as I mingled and got to know other students, they didn't know me from Adam. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that did something to me. That, that impacted me in a very powerful way. And, uh, and I, till this day, I, I, I know that it was God's doing. Mm -hmm. Because it was, not, it was a very difficult time, to be honest with you, because I started questioning my faith in the sense of why? Why do I believe what I believe? And, um, and this caused a lot of emotions, you know, mm -hmm. uh, questionings that I had never asked before. So mm -hmm. in a sense, it was a dark time. Mm -hmm. And because um, I knew I shouldn't be asking these questions, but I, but I was. But and, actually, um, hold just a second. It's okay to ask those questions, yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but keep going. <laughs> well, let but me tell you why I said that, though. Okay. Because I was in the theology department. Okay. I was enrolled to be a pastor. So you thought it was a little awkward. A little awkward. For a, pa a pastor in training to ask big questions about whether there's a God and how he would relate to my life. How, how did Jesus deliver? How did the light of the world deliver you from the darkness? You know, and I'm so thankful that the Spirit of God was there to, to literally impress me with the steps I should take. Mm. What I did was I felt impressed to take my Bible and go up behind the campus. It was a biology, biology trail. And I took my Bible and I went on by myself down this trail in the backwoods and no one was around. And I remember I, I, I fell down on my knees mm -hmm. and, and I began to pray. And my prayer was simply this, God, convict me. Ah. I need conviction. <laughs> convict me. And it was audible, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking no one heard me, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, was, um, I was just, it was just me and God. You mm. know? And, uh, and that was the beginning of several personal mm -hmm. encounters with God where my prayer was the same, convict me, convict me, convict me. Mm. And this went for about a few months. And m to make the long story short, I'm praising God because he answered my prayer because I literally felt fire in my bones, if you want yeah. to put it that way. Wow. I felt mm -hmm. conviction. Mm. Um, and for the first time in my young adult life, I felt like I had taken ownership of my faith wow. and, mm -hmm. uh, and had walked into, into the marvelous light. <laughs> what a powerful testimony. Mm -hmm. Someone is watching today that says, I need to go out and, and, mm -hmm. and say, Lord, convict me, mm -hmm. convict yes. me, yeah. dispel the darkness. Yeah. Yes. And the darkness may not be that we're doing anything terribly evil or wicked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's just like the darkness of the world. The world yes. is full of darkness. Mm -hmm. yes. And we need the light of Jesus to dispel us. Well, he's more yes. than just the light, the great light. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 9 now. And Jason, if you could read what is perhaps one of the best passages, best known, at least for those who sing in Handel's <laughs> Messiah, right? They say, I think I've heard this before. Would you read it for us? Verses 6 and 7. I've got the New King James Version here, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Mm -hmm. I want you to notice, just like we were saying about the virgin conceiving and bearing a child called Emmanuel, this is not just some ordinary baby born 700 right. years before mm -hmm. uh, the Messiah came, right? right? This is a prophecy. The same here, this kingdom is going to last forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which title yeah. there, speaking about Messiah, really catches your attention? Anybody? There's no right or wrong answer there. Yeah. Which one catches your attention, Lisa? I like Everlasting Father. 
And that again goes to, you know, him being Alpha and Omega. He's there from the beginning and his kingdom will have no end. So just showing the expanse of his kingdom, it gives me a lot of security. Mm -hmm. Now, someone might say, but he's the eternal son, not the, the father. But Jesus did say when he came to this earth, the son of God became flesh. If you've seen mm -hmm. me, you've seen the father. You've seen the father. Yeah, so he's right. a revelation of the mm -hmm. everlasting father. Yeah. Stephanie? Yeah. I think what impacted me the most was that the government shall be upon a child's shoulder. Mm. Ah. Mm. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon the child's shoulder. And yet that child is more than just mm. a human being. That's a profound thought that as this little baby and then little toddler and then little boy is growing up, that he is mm. the one upon whom the government rests. rests. I mean, that's yeah. profound, isn't it? Um, yes, Billy. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I like all of them. I, <laughs> I don't have a, that's a good. favorite one. It reminds me of, um, you know, when somebody is so excited about seeing something that's wonderful and they cannot put it in, into words, <laughs> I think that's what's happening now. I remember, for instance, um, there's this big park uh, in the United States called the Grand Canyon. And my first exposure to the Grand Canyon, I said, what is, like, I don't know how to describe it. And I found myself explaining to a friend of mine that it's like a big, huge bowl, and it's, it's like empty. And so I was trying to describe it, but I couldn't find the words. So I think that's what uh, Isaiah is doing. Isaiah is giving, like, you know, wonderful counselor. And it's funny that before that, at least in my version, it says, in his name shall be called. He didn't say names. He said his name. So he's trying his best to describe <laughs> how wonderful uh, that child would be. You kind of think of uh, the Apostle John in the Revelation trying to describe, you know, this glorious being and he falls down at his feet. You know, it's like uh, something that's beyond human words to describe. Yes. 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 But let's go forward to Luke now and see how the angels uh, describe this special child who will be born. Luke 2, verses 9 through 11. Christian, if you could read Luke 2, 9 through 11. I like, I like it when, when we, we hear a direct prophecy or a direct word from angels. Mm -hmm. You know, the angels also said this same Jesus is coming back again, right? Mm -hmm. In like manner. Mm -hmm. yes, I love to yes. hear those heavenly messengers. What do they say here in, uh, this is right at the time that, that the prophecy is fulfilled, the, mm -hmm. the child has been born. Okay, I'll be reading Luke chapter 2, verses 9 to 11 from the New King James Version. And it says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Mm -hmm. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Mm. A Savior Christ, Christ mm. is, is, is Christos, is Messiah mm -hmm. in mm. Hebrew, right? It's, so it's like this is, this is the one, yeah. mm -hmm. Christ the Lord, He's born, a Savior. Now I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. If Jesus, the Messiah, is the Savior of the world, Will everybody be saved? Mm. You know, there's some people that mm. believe that. We'll mm. all be saved because Jesus is a perfect Savior and he, He's the Savior of the world. Mm -hmm. Will everybody be saved? Help me with the Bi Bible insight there. Yes, Lisa. Um, everyone will be saved who wants to be saved. Everyone will be saved who wants to Doesn't be. it say somewhere, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord mm -hmm. will be saved? Mm -hmm. So that makes that choice to accept mm -hmm. that salvation. Mm -hmm. Yes, Christian. Well, John 3, 16, the verse that is so well known says, For whosoever believes in him mm -hmm. shall should, have eternal life. Should not perish. Should not perish, but, but have eternal life. So you would say everyone can choose to mm -hmm. be saved. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. But everyone has a choice yes. Yes. to believe. Now, it's interesting yeah. that Christian shared a powerful testimony. Mm -hmm. He grew up in a home where God's Word was honored. His parents were followers of Jesus. But he had to make that faith okay. his own, yes. Yes. personal. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, 
we all come from different backgrounds. Do you remember a time when you said, I, I'm going to personally accept Jesus as my Savior. I'm going to say, Jesus, will you save me? Anybody? Jason, you grew up in a Christian family, I think, right? Yes. But you also had to make a choice. Do you remember when that happened? I do remember a specific time. I was around 10 years old, and I remember I was at a Christian summer camp. And during that time, uh, there, were, there were some songs about accepting Christ, and the leader of the camp uh, made an appeal for us to actually walk forward if we wanted to accept Christ as our Savior. And I don't believe before that point I'd actually responded to a specific appeal like this. And so I prayed to God, because I had prayed and I'd been talking to God, but I actually said I felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to go to the front and basically sort of by walking to the front, make this public commitment, praying to God, say, yes, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, as my Redeemer. Beautiful. Ten years old. That was a few years ago, but it's <laughs> changed the course of action from, from then on, right? Yes, amen. And yes. here you are on the Hope Sabbath School team. Anybody else? Can you think of a specific time? Lisa, you also grew up with godly parents, love the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're active leaders in, in church, mm -hmm. but, but you had to have a time too. Can you think of a time? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I went through church school, I went to an Adventist Academy and an Adventist College, but it wasn't until my health crisis mm -hmm. that really was a turning point in my life. And um, as I've shared in this program, I was diagnosed with cancer, and it was until I faced death that I started to ask the difficult questions. You know, if it were my time to die, what would be the other side of it? And I couldn't answer that because I didn't think that my life merited eternal life. And so I really had to dig in deeper. And it really was a turning point. If, if my life meant something, then was I living it to the glory of God? And if it was time for me to go, could I really come before God and say, yes, you know, I do want to receive this eternal life. Amen. It's a choice we all have to make, wow. which is what the next verses talk about. We could just end with Handel's Messiah, you know, hallelujah. <laughs> no. But uh, but there's a choice to make. Billy, yeah. could you read the next verses in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 through 10? Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. It's, uh, it's clear that we, we all have a choice to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And I'll be reading from the uh, New King James Version, Isaiah 9, 8 through 10. The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Mm -hmm. Now it would be nice if there was a recording of that, because it says they said with pride and arrogance, mm -hmm. the bricks have fallen down, yeah. but we will rebuild with mm -hmm. hewn stones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sycamore trees have fallen down, mm -hmm. but we will replace them, I could add a word, with massive cedars. Mm -hmm. Do you see that arrogant yeah. attitude? Yeah. Mm -hmm. God is calling them to yes. repent, yeah. and they're saying, in pride and arrogance, mm -hmm. well, if things fall down, we'll build them even stronger than before. Mm. Yeah. Where do you see that arrogant attitude elsewhere in Scripture? It is so dangerous, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, is there a story that comes to your mind and you say, oh, Jason, which one comes to mind? That sounds like the Tower of Babel to me, where the people literally said, we're going to come together and we're going to build this tower to show that we are greater than God and no flood can ever happen mm -hmm. and we can unite man under our own power. We don't need God. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 11, right? Yes. Yeah. So there's this story. People have heard of the Tower of Babel, but they don't realize mm -hmm. that that was an act of pride Defiance. and arrogance, mm -hmm. just like this attitude. Yeah. Bricks fall down, we'll put big rocks. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Little sycamores fall down, we'll put huge cedars. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. else do you see that? Because that is, you know what, that is the greatest sin. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. This proud, arrogant resistance against the love and mercy of God. See, Stephanie? It all stems from Lucifer, I believe. It Human does. Human beings are led by his influence to make these 
bold statement. Let's go there. We're actually going to study that in greater detail in, in a, a lesson that's just coming. But, but maybe someone who's here today for our program will miss it. So go to Isaiah 14 with us, if you would, because there in verses 12 to 14, again, it's speaking about pride and arrogance mm -hmm of a king of that time, mm -hmm. but then something happens in the prophet's words, and it's clear that he's talking about a cosmic picture, yes. Yes. cosmic conflict. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you read that for us in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14? Sure, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, who didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Mm. 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 Did you count how many I wills were there? <laughs> mm. I counted five, <laughs> but, but you see it's a, it's a problem, it isn't is. it? Yeah. Uh, against God, yeah. I'm going to usurp Mm -hmm. God's position. Mm -hmm. You say, Derry, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible to have that proud and arrogant attitude, yeah. Yeah. right? True. Yeah. Lisa? Yeah. And I just think back to Christ's um, testimony, I think it's in Philippians 4, where he said that he mm -hmm. considered it not robbery to be equal to God. Philippians 2, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, so he humbles himself. He humbles himself, even though he is, I mean, in the same likeness of God, he didn't think that I shouldn't put myself in the place of God. So we see two individuals who are in the presence of God, but their hearts are completely mm. different. Wow. The incarnation is the ultimate act of humility. Mm. Mm -hmm. yes. that, that the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, mm -hmm. would come not only into humanity mm -hmm. and take the form of a servant, mm -hmm. be, be obedient even to death. to death. That's the text, isn't it, in Philippians mm -hmm. 2. Even unto death is the ultimate act of humility. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. Lucifer, who's described in another place as a covering cherub who was created, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the ultimate picture of pride and mm -hmm. arrogance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so thankful when you read this whole controversy that it's the one who humbled himself mm -hmm. and yes. came down yeah. who is Amen. the victor, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Just want to praise yeah. God for that, <laughs> yeah. Christian. You know, in, in the passage that Billy read a moment ago, I find it interesting that it says that they, they said, we will, we will. Mm -hmm. That's repeated in that initial passage, we, mm -hmm. will. we will. But here in uh, Isaiah, or rather, yes, Isaiah 14, we find the repetition of I will, I will. So there's that common theme, we will, I will. Mm. And then, but then you refer to Jesus and his words mm. in the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. where he said, not ah, my, my will. <laughs> but thy will be done. Pointing to the so, Father, right? So what, a, what, a, what an amazing Ooh. contrast there of mm. pride and humility. I feel we're walking on holy ground. <laughs> <laughs> we're, mm. we're walking on holy ground yeah. because all of us run the danger mm. of a proud and arrogant wow. spirit. Yes. Yes. Yep. Mm. Yeah. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God yeah. mm. yes. and He will he lift us up. Yeah. in due time, mm. yeah. yes. according to his plan. Well, yeah. we're going on to verse 13, Lisa, of Isaiah. It's just one chapter <laughs> of this amazing book. Isaiah mm. 9, verse 13, mm -hmm. we, we find here, well, if God loves the world, like Christian quoted mm -hmm. from John 3, 16, yeah. mm. why does he chastise people? Mm. Let's see what it says in okay. Isaiah 9, verse 13. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For the people do not turn to him, who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Now, you say, Whew, what does it mean he strikes them? Give me that in another, in other language. He disciplines. Disciplines them. Okay. Mm -hmm. We know times, example, would be when they're going to be taken into captivity, right? Yes. yes. That he's doing that because he wants them to repent, repent. Yeah. Yeah. and turn, and turn yes. from their wicked ways to him. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it say somewhere those the Lord loves he chastens he yes. or rebukes? Yes. Mm -hmm. So why does he do that? Help me again because the rebellious heart just resists that. Mm -hmm. What's God doing there? Mm. Yes, Stephanie. From a bigger picture when I as I was reading through Isaiah, every I could see God 
calling them to come out and pleading with them change. These are the results, though, if you don't. But there was a constant pleading for them to turn. And I believe that that's his heart, is that he wants us to turn, that we might have life and have it more abundantly, a life with him. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12 and see if uh, this might help us. Mm. Hebrews chapter 12. And um, let's, let's begin with verse 3, if we can. Jason, could you read uh, from verse 3 down through verse 11? and see if that sheds some light. Uh, we know here that God wants everyone to be saved, right? Mm -hmm. And yet there's this proud, arrogant spirit that rises up so easily. What does the scripture say in Hebrews 12, beginning with verse three? I've got the New King James Version. Hebrews chapter 12, verses three through 11 says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, mm -hmm. and we paid them respect. Mm -hmm. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Mm -hmm. For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Mm -hmm. Now no chastening seems to be joyful mm -hmm. for the present, True. but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness mm -hmm. to those who have been trained by it. Mm -hmm. So can you think of a time in your life when uh, the Lord chastened you? <laughs> <laughs> now you say, Lord, I, I didn't like it at the time. In fact, doesn't it say it's not pleasant, right? Mm -hmm. Not particularly pleasant when it's happening. But I look back and I say, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm for letting me have that difficult experience. Uh, Billy, and I'm sure someone watching, if you're watching Hope Sabbath School today, you say, Derek, I have a testimony. You can write to us at sshope at hopetv.org. You say, I, I remember when the Lord chastened me, but he did it because he loves me, mm -hmm. right? Wants me to turn to him. Billy. Yeah. Well, the Lord is still chasing me. <laughs> even still today. chasing. Yes, I think that's true. And, and I think, um, and I'm going to get to my testimony, I think the reason why is because he's, he's trying to build in us that, that sense of humility. Like, mm. sometimes we need to humble ourselves. You know, every time we take a step uh, up or a step forward, you know, we learn more things. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, about the Bible, oh, you know, we just memorized a new verse. You know, there's a little pride that sometimes creeps in, <laughs> and God has to bring us down. Um, I remember, uh, for me, uh, going from... Uh, um, uh, uh, high school into college, I was acing exams. I was a top uh, uh, student, and then when I got got into college, I I just flunked it. Well, I, I was not uh, 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 passing uh, a lot of classes. I was just getting a lot of bad grades, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, God, you know, what's going on? And I remembered that it got to the point where even the dean of the school got in my case and said that if you did not, you know, pass the next semester, you will be kicked out. Um, and I finally, in a sense, like gave up in a sense, like doing things my own way. Mm. And I just relied completely uh, on God. Mm. Um, and later on, I, I found out that I was diagnosed with a particular disease that affected my learning ability. And mm. I made it. I, I uh, made it uh, out of, uh, from college. But then I always ask God, why did you allow that to happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I, I mm -hmm. did, I felt very cha you know, chased, uh, chastened a lot, uh, only to find out two years later that I had uh, kids who also struggled, who looked like me, who were struggling in school. 
And I told him that, hey, you know, you guys think you had it, had it bad, but, you know, I got it so bad that uh, the dean of a school of, you know, 800 plus kids, you know, got onto my case, saw that I was, you know, bound for failure, and he, he basically wrote that to me because I was that bad. Mm. Um, but God got me through. Amen. And that was an encouraging, I encouragement, not just for them, but also uh, 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 friends, uh, family friends who felt the same way about their sons, uh, that, you know, you, uh, they, they see them in me, and they see that they're not going to make it. It's so hard. But I told them that, no, God got me through this. So you, yeah. God gave you a testimony yeah. through that chastening. Yes. You know, I had a little flashback when, we, when I asked that question. Mm -hmm. It was the day of my doctoral defense for my doctorate. And I was feeling a little bit, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> proud of myself. I was reading through the Bible. This was totally unplanned except by God. Mm -hmm. I'm reading through Jeremiah, and I'm, I'm not going to have you turn to it. It says in Jeremiah 9, 23, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let the one who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, yeah. that I am mm -hmm. the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a little boing on the side of my head that morning of saying, Derek, you know, <laughs> I've got a plan for you, but stay humble, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to yes. boast about anything, yeah. boast. boast about my character and who I am. Yes? Yes. yes? yes. yes. Great and awesome God. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. We need some chastening mm. every once in a while. Yes. I sense some may be coming our way, but <laughs> we, we know that the ones that the Lord loves, He chastens. Exactly. In the last minutes of our study, we just want to look at a few other passages, now going to mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 11 and 12, and you say, Derek, there's just so much in this book, mm -hmm. but it's all pointing to Jesus the Messiah, every portion fulfilled in Him. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 11, Christian, if you could start by reading verses 1 and 2, and then Stephanie, I'll ask you to read verses 3 through 5. We're going to look at a few verses in chapter 11. Christian? Okay, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Mm. Now, does that ring some bells or wave a little flag connected to Jesus? <laughs> uh, what, what words tie in there, Jason, that catch your attention? So, stem of Jesse, Jesse was David, the king's father. Okay, and, and of course, Jesus is the son of David. In fact, that's also a, a, a messianic term. They call him son of David, right? Mm -hmm. Hosanna to the son of David. Yeah, yeah. So immediately you see that. Did you see anything else in the prophecy that caught your attention? What about the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him? Do you remember the prophecy that Jesus quoted in Nazareth? It was actually also by Isaiah yeah. the prophet yeah. where he yeah. said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. So you see, in the time of Jesus, when this is happening, mm -hmm. those people who've read the prophecies, including the gospel prophet, it's like one thing yes. after another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go on, Stephanie, verses 3 through 5 of chapter 11. And the King James Version says, And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Mm -hmm. Now is that prophecy speaking about the glorious second coming of Jesus? Or is it speaking about the first coming as a baby in Bethlehem? Second, second coming. It, it sounds like it, doesn't yeah. it? There's yeah. the judgment, yeah. Oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, not everybody will welcome him because they didn't mm -hmm. choose mm -hmm. to accept his salvation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
I don't know. Do you think Isaiah knew all of what, what this meant? Or was he just by the Spirit recording it, uh, trying to find the words guided by the Spirit? What do you think, Stephanie? I th he probably understood some of it, but I don't think he understood it to the full extent. But he was doing what the Holy Spirit was leading him to write down. Because there's times when we speak. I was speaking to Lisa off the air, and she was sharing a testimony of how God had led her to say something, and um, it, she didn't fully understand or fully grasp what that meant until mm -hmm. after she had said it. Mm. Wow. Well, I think that's true with prophecy. And Lisa, I'm going to ask you to read the next verses for us, uh, 11 verses 6 through 9, that sometimes it's only after the prophecy is fulfilled mm -hmm. that we fully understand it. Mm -hmm. Can you think of that? Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days, mm. I will raise it up again. Yep. Mm -hmm. They thought he was talking about the physical building. But, but John says, after the resurrection, the we remembered. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then they understood the prophecy. Mm -hmm. Let's read on. This is amazing. Chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. Okay, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, mm. and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in mm. all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So, Jason, what's happening now? What, what's, what's the vision sh showing him now? Now we're seeing the new earth because this is clearly not the <laughs> earth that we live on today. <laughs> it isn't, is it? And let's not get bogged down with are there vipers on the new heavens and new earth. The point mm -hmm. is it's totally different. All of yes. the dangers that were in this earth are gone, That's mm -hmm. right? right? And there is, a, there is a place where righteousness dwells. Mm -hmm. uh, that, th we're going to study more about that in this series, but I want to come to the last passage. And Christian, I'm going to ask if you'd read for us chapter 12. It, it's actually a hymn. Chapter 12 of Isaiah, a hymn of praise, verses 1 through 6. And I think it's an appropriate way to finish our study. We just want to say, Lord God, you're so awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he loved the world so much. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us as our Savior. Let's read chapter 12, all, all six verses. Okay, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, In that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you, though you were angry with me. Mm. Your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He is also has become my salvation. Therefore, with the joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, Praise the Lord. Call upon His name. Mm. Declare His deeds among the peoples. Make mention that His name is exalted. Sing to the Lord. For He has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. So we started out by saying we praise Him who called us out of darkness. He's yeah. the light of the world, Messiah, mm -hmm. into His marvelous light. And we end with uh, just praising the Holy One in our midst. Mm -hmm. What's the most important lesson you've taken from our study today? Yes, Lisa. I like what it says there in verse 1, that your anger is turned away and you comfort me. God's anger is not forever, and we don't believe that it's a, you know, a forever anger, but at some point, He will turn and He will comfort us. And so if we've enjoyed chastening or discipline, whatever it is, God still wants to comfort us and, and calm us down. So that's I think, a promise. I think He's really angry with the proud and arrogant spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He loves us. God so loved the world, right? Yeah. But, but He's angry because that proud and arrogant yeah. spirit could cause our eternal ruin. Mm -hmm. That's right. right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, he, he wants to uh, draw us into that loving relationship mm -hmm. with himself. Well, you're watching today and you're saying, 
I want that close, intimate relationship with God. I, I, I want to be out of darkness in His marvelous light. Well, that's our prayer for you. And I want to just remind you of this beautiful resource, Radical Evidence. Jesus is not just another great teacher. He's not just another prophet. He is the Messiah. And all of the prophecies of Messiah are fulfilled in Him. You'll learn about it in this book, Radical Evidence. You can share with others. All you have to do is write us an email, sshope, hopetv.org, and put in the line, in the subject line, free offer. We'll make sure you can get a free download of the audiobook, Radical Evidence. I want you to be able to share with others that Jesus the Messiah can dispel the darkness mm -hmm. and save them too. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a powerful study. The Spirit of God revealed so much to Isaiah the prophet. Thank you that he was willing to say, here am I, send me. He was willing to write down this record and that the Spirit of God preserved it for us today. Yes. I pray that all darkness would be dispelled from our lives by Jesus, the light of the world, yes. and we would share his light with others. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I've heard the church talk about this plan called I Will Go. It's got my attention, but what is it? I Will Go is the brand new strategic plan for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The phrase is rooted in key passages like Isaiah 6, when Isaiah responded to God's call by saying, Here am I, send me. And Matthew 28, when Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples. Now it's our turn. The strategic plan is part of our response. It will do two things. One, equip you with what you need to embrace your call to mission, and two, provide you with indicators to track your progress as you respond, okay, Jesus, I will go. I think I'm following, but what is that mission? I'm glad you asked. Our mission as Adventists is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return. It is a big task, but no one has to do it alone. We have a massive support system of more than 21 million members in over 160,000 congregations throughout the world. Phew, that's a lot of members. Have we made progress? With that many, how could we not? But we're always open to improvement. I Will Go builds on the success of our previous strategic plan called Reach the World, where we set out to... Let me guess, Reach the World? <laughs> what gave it away? Following Reach the World, the Church evaluated the effectiveness of our different initiatives worldwide to gain valuable insights for the future. Basically, after years of work and research, we developed that evaluation system and transformed it into a strategy that will run from 2020 to 2025, which we're calling, I Will Go. Okay, evaluation, got it. What happens with those insights? Adventist church leaders create a plan and then what? Just tell the world what to do? <laughs> Not at all. All that research will only be worthwhile if Adventists all around the world engage, collaborate, and innovate right where they are. I Will Go isn't about telling you what to do. It's about helping you follow through with what God has already placed on your heart. Every spiritual influencer needs support to be successful, and the church wants to provide that. Ooh, I like the idea of getting support. So how does it work? I Will Go is made up of 10 objectives that are divided into three areas of impact, mission, spiritual growth, and leadership. Each objective has its own Key Performance Indicators, or KPIs for short. KPIs are measurable ways to help you determine whether or not you are achieving your current objective. There's no sign-up needed. They're there for you as you need them. Think of them like segments in a progress bar. Progress tracking sounds great, but what if I don't even know where to start? Don't worry. The KPIs also serve as a sort of brainstorming tool with examples to help you get started. Some KPIs are intended for those in church leadership roles, Others are intended for individuals like you and me. And the objectives can help you determine which KPIs to use. The great thing is, if the Holy Spirit inspires you to create something completely new that isn't on the list, yet accomplishes the mission, go for it. What about church initiatives we've already been doing? Does this mean that we'll replace them? Nope. Initiatives like digital evangelism or revival and reformation are actually methods of fulfilling the I Will Go plan. Take, for example, hmm... The TMI Initiative. It's where all members of the Adventist Church are involved in some form of intentional mission. 
Yes, sir. TMI is just one way to fulfill the I will go plan because it seeks to involve everyone. So basically, the I will go strategy helps Adventists like me create brand new initiatives and improve the initiatives that we already do. You got it. I will go is not some feel good slogan for lukewarm members to comfortably observe mission from afar. If we're serious about completing the mission, we need to strategize. That's why we're urging all who bear the Adventist name to understand and embrace the I will go strategic plan from the areas of impact down to the KPIs. We may talk the talk, but the I will go plan translates our mission into tangible, realistic goals in order to walk the walk. By applying them, we can ensure we practice what we preach. I think I get it now. This is a rallying cry for Adventists everywhere to fully embrace the calling God has placed on them. Jesus commanded, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And this is our opportunity to say, I will go. Whenever the Holy Spirit inspires you with ideas for how you and your local church can make an impact, we challenge you to respond, I, I will go. go. Well, this is our time to come together again as we worship God, as we hear his words, as we spend time in, in worship and communion with him. I believe that God just loves us to worship him and it's going to be something that we will do when we get to heaven. We will have an uninhibited joy to worship God. So let us practice on earth. And so wherever you are today, whatever room you may be in watching this service, let us open our hearts to him now and allow him to speak to you, speak to me, as we go through this uh, message that we will hear, through the words, through the prayer, through the special music, let God speak. And so now, let us join together and sing hymns in praise to God.
This is the part of our service where we'd like to show you how you can give to your local conference or mission through your tithes, offerings or donations. Guys, we did it. We made it to 2021. Yes! Finally! Look at us. Hey, look at us. Look at us. Huh? Who would have thought? Not me. Yeah, feels good to be in the new year. I think we can all agree that 2020 was not good. <laughs> But that's all in the past now, thankfully. <laughs> if we somehow manage to get back to this little thing called normal life, then 2021 is just gonna hit differently, you know what I mean? My year is different to your day. So when it comes to the New Year's, everyone does this thing called New Year's resolutions. You basically make a list of all the things you want to achieve in the next year. See, it's all about change. What can you change about yourself to make yourself better for the next year? Usually people are like, okay, this is the year I'm for sure going to exercise more. But then like a month later, they just give up. <laughs> so when it comes to the Bible on this topic, there are a lot of people who changed for the better. Like Moses. Not only was Moses said to be a terrible speaker, but he was also a murderer. Nevertheless, God still used him to lead the people of Israel. Before Jesus' disciples became disciples, they were literally just fishermen. And then there was the prosecutor Saul, who became the apostle Paul after being blinded by the light of God. My eyes! But today I'm going to be focusing on Zacchaeus, or is it Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus? All right, hold on. Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus. Okay, we'll go with Zacchaeus. So Jesus was walking through Jericho and there was a man called Zacchaeus. He was a rich tax collector. Nobody liked him though because he always cheated people to get more money. <laughs> a rich hey. But when Jesus came to his town, Zacchaeus really wanted to see him. The problem was was that he was really small so he couldn't see behind the large crowds. So he actually climbed up a sycamore tree so we can actually get a good view of Jesus. Work smarter, not harder. But the plan didn't last long anyway, cause as soon as Jesus came round to his spot, he pretty much immediately caught him hiding in the tree. Ah! Hurry down, Zacchaeus. For I must stay in your house today. My house? Huh? Yep, Jesus didn't scold him or anything. Even though Zacchaeus was essentially a thief, Jesus still wanted to eat with him. I give half of my belongings to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I will pay him back four times as much. Ah! <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't believe it. A tax collector paying back his taxes. Impossible. <laughs> So yeah, as you can see, because Jesus visited him out of kindness, Zacchaeus did change for the better, and he gave all his riches he falsely took back to the poor. Salvation has come to this house today, for this man also is a descendant of Abraham. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Well done, Zacchaeus. So yeah, guys, if you currently have something holding you back from being the best person you can possibly be, whether it's a sin or even just a bad habit, come on, let's really try and get rid of it this year, guys. And if you struggle, just pray about it because God will help you. Anyway, that's it from me. I hope you guys have a happy new year and God bless.
Let us pray. Our loving Father, uh, which art in heaven, we approach your throne of grace with hearts filled with gratitude for your mercies that are renewed each day. We thankful for Jesus who died, shed his blood to save us. We're thankful for the purpose of life. Help us each one to identify our purpose. We're thankful that though we face difficult times, we have hope because you have promised to be with us every step of the way. We recommit our lives to you and we pray that we may continually find encouragement in your word. We claim your promises. There is someone right now that needs healing. We pray for such a one that you may bring healing according to your will. We pray for those that may be lonely. May they sense your presence. We pray for the young people who may be faced with different situations, pressures of life. May they come to you knowing that you care. We pray for your work and for your workers. May your gospel continue to be preached throughout this world with power. When all is said and done, we look forward to your soon return. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, church. A blessed Sabbath to you all. The message that I've given for this Sabbath morning is called Dreams and Hopes. Here we are in, in a new year. And with the new year comes new resolutions, right? Maybe to find a better job, maybe to work harder, to study more, lose weight, get more fit. I mean, that definitely fits with my dreams and my hope for 2021. What about you? For it to happen, for your dreams, for your hopes to take place, what would it take? How could it happen? You see, when we look at famous people in our history, how did they make happen their, their dreams, their hopes? I mean, when we think of people like Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, John F. Kennedy, Shackleton, Martin Luther King, isn't it true that all they had in common, especially, was a dream that they had? Gandhi was dreaming of, an, of a possible independent India, where, whereas if you were to be working and you would be making money, an income, it would not flow into another big empire, but it could be used for the people of the country itself. Mandela, who was looking into the future and was dreaming of, of a South Africa and of a whole African continent where people would be seen as equal to one another. Kennedy, dreaming that they would be to be the first power here on Earth that could reach the moon. Shackleton, Shackleton, dreaming to, to be the first to cross the Antarctica. And then, of course, Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, who even in his speech used those words, I have a dream. For dreams to come true, you and I need to have hope. Hope that your future will be okay to see those dreams take shape, to come about. The passage that I've chosen for this Sabbath morning comes from that wonderful book of songs, the book of Psalms. It's filled with, with, with hymns, with songs, and, and especially the one that I would like us to have a look at this morning is Psalm chapter 13. Psalm chapter 13, verse 1 to 7. It says there, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy, enemy triumph over me? Look on me and, and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fail. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. I mean, there is this wonderful story of this, this submarine. Years ago, this submarine, as it was coming to the surface, it got hit by another ship. And the story tells us that the submarine sank straight away. The entire crew was trapped. Every member of the crew came up with ideas and they tried everything. But no matter the idea they had, it failed. Their last hope 
was an option that came from, from above, from one of the ships searching. A deep sea diver went all the way down to the submarine. And as he came down, he could hear tapping, tapping on the steel wall of the sunken submarine. And so he put his, his metal helmet of his deep sea diving equipment, the metal helmet, he put it close to the hull, to the side of the submarine. And as he was listening to the tapping, he realized what he was listening to were Morse code. He heard Morse code and as he was trying to decipher the message, this is what he heard being tapped there on the hull. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Someone once said this, you and I, we can live for 40 days without food. We can live for eight days without water. We can even live for four minutes without air, but we can only live a few seconds without hope. So as we were reading that Psalm 13, those words written by David, what, what, what were your emotions? How did you feel as you were listening to these words? Wouldn't you agree that, that it seems dark, almost depressing? But you know what, brothers and sisters, that Psalm 13 is actually called a Psalm of hope. A Psalm of hope. And so let us see if we can, can paint a picture as we read the psalm again. Because it's a picture of, of almost like looking at a mountain. And as we go up on the mountain, we find David first there, there down on the lowest part of the, of the mountain in a valley. As he's looking up on that tall mountain. But then as we come into the second part of, of, of this, this, this part of, of Psalm 13... David has started to climb the mountain, the mountain of faith that is before him. And then in the third part, David has reached the top of the mountain. And from the top, David can look back. He can look back and he can now see how God was always with him through it all. God was there in the valley. God was on the way up and God is there all the way on the top. And so what do we hear David saying as he's traveling up this mountain of faith? He starts with the words, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must, must I wrestle? Must I wrestle? Wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? I mean, it's almost as, as if, if, if David is singing a, 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 like, like, like the blues. It's almost like a hymn of blues. It's almost like you hear David singing. Well, I woke up this morning and Lord, where were you? The blues, I mean, aren't we all going through blues times? Wouldn't we say that this last year and this first part of the year is... Pretty much like the blues, tough times. I mean, we find a David who, who was depressed, his anxiety levels sky high. It's four times that he, he is asking God, how long? How long, O oh Lord? How long? Was it maybe in the time when David is being chased by King Saul? Did he write these words? What to do? When your and my plans and hopes are turning out to be empty. When it turns out bad. How long, O oh Lord? But what does David do? As he keeps on climbing this mountain, verses 3 and 4, he continues, Look on me and answer, O oh Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. There's this 
The story that says a pilot who was flying his plane full of passengers on the way to their destination. When suddenly the rudder malfunctioned. I mean, and the rudder is of course that what, what steers the plane. So he contacted the control tower in panic and shouted, the rudder has malfunctioned, what shall I do? The air traffic controller radioed back. Captain, keep calm. Just repeat after me. Wings flap, check. Velocity, check. Altitude, check. So the pilot made the appropriate changes and, and the aircraft started to continue on its right course. But not five minutes later, the starboard engine failed. And so the pilot contacted the control tower once again and shouted, the starboard engine has stalled, what shall I do? And the air traffic controller radioed back, keep calm, captain, keep calm, just repeat after me. Wings flap, check. Velocity, check. Altitude, check. Once again, the captain made the changes, and again the aeroplane continued on its course. However, only five minutes later, the pilot contacted the control tower again, a third time. This time he shouted, Mayday! Mayday! Both engines have gone. What shall I do? The air traffic controller radioed back. Captain, keep calm, just repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, of course, this is not a real story, not a story in the sense that it really happened. At least I hope it didn't. But, but it tells us something in, in this, this illustration, a kind of a lesson. I mean, someone wrote it in words like this. When we rely on organizations, we will get what organizations can do. When we rely on education, we get what education can do. When you and I rely on people, we will get what people can do. But when we rely on prayer, you and I get, receive what God can do. And so David is climbing this mountain of faith. Look on me and answer, O Lord. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemies will say I've overcome them and my foes will rejoice when I fall. David is still struggling, but he has started to climb the mountain of faith. He has stopped asking the question, how long, Lord? All he now wants to, to do, to, to see happening is to understand. Lord, give light to my eyes. Let them see, or I will, I will sleep in death. In death, I won't see anything. You and I, we all, brothers and sisters, we will experience difficulties, right? I mean, that is life. Even as followers of Jesus Christ, we will have struggles in life. But as followers of Christ, we believe that God promises us that he will be with us through thick and thin, through all difficulties. In the great Christian writer and preacher, Charles Spurgeon, put it like this. A little faith will take your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Let me repeat it because I love those words. A little faith will take your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. I mean, we find that, that David, in his struggling, through all the difficulties, he reaches the mountaintop. For in verse 5 and 6, he says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. A pastor, during a sermon, asked his congregation the following. Dear brothers and sisters, in your times of difficulty, what is your favorite Bible verse? And so a young man stood up and said, Pastor, that's easy, that Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
A middle-aged woman stood up and said, Pastor, Psalm 46, verse 1. God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now a retired lady stood up and said, Minister, it's John 16, verses 33 to 35. In this world, you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. Now Uncle John stood up. He, he was the oldest member of the congregation, 92 years old. He stood up and he said, and it came to pass. It became quiet. And now in the congregation, you could hear how here and there some people started to, to snicker a little bit. And probably they were thinking to themselves like, oh, Uncle John has really lost it now. He is so old. Now he doesn't even remember anymore what the question was about. But old brother John continued. Dear friends, 396 verses in the Bible say this. And it came to pass. At the age of 30, I lost my job with six hungry mouths and feed, mouths to feed, including also a wife. I didn't know how, how I would make it. At 40, my oldest son was killed overseas in war. It knocked me down. At 50, my house burned to the ground and nothing was saved. At 60, my wife of 40 years was diagnosed with cancer. It slowly ate away at her. We cried together many a night on our knees in prayer. At 65, she died, and I still miss her today. The agony I went through in each of these situations was unbelievable, dear brothers and sisters. Every time I wondered, where was God? But each time I looked in the Bible and I saw one of those 396 verses that said, and it came to pass. I felt that God was telling me my pain, my circumstances were also going to pass and that God would get me through them. David arrives at the top of the mountain of faith where he is able to shout it out, God, I may not have all the answers, but I'm going to trust you anyway. David teaches us all three things we can remember when we dream and hope for this new year. Number one, God's unfailing love. As he says, but I trust in your unfailing love, God. God's unfailing love. Secondly, God's salvation. He says, my heart rejoices in your salvation, O Lord. And thirdly, God's goodness. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. David realizes through it all that God was there all the time. The story is told of the early American natives that they had a unique way of training their young men to become brave adults. On the night of a boy's birth, 13th birthday, after having been learning already how to hunt, how to scout, how to fish, there was one final test. The boy would be placed in, in a dense forest and he had to spend there the entire night all alone. Now we have to understand that until then, these young men and this boy would have never yet left the security of the family and of the tribe. This was the first time. But on this night, he was blindfolded and taken several miles away. When he took off the blindfold, the young boy would find himself in the middle of a dark forest and he got terrified. He got afraid. A every sound of, of a twig that he would hear snapping. In his mind, he would already see these animals, ferocious animals, running at him to kill him. 
and what felt like an eternity. Eventually, the dawn would break and the first rays of sunlight entering through these, these, these trees all around him. And now the, the young boy was able to look around and he saw again some of the shapes of the, of the flowers, of the trees, the outline of the path that he came through. And then, to his utter surprise, he saw a silhouette of a man just standing a few feet away from him armed with a bow and an arrow. It was his father. The father had been there all night long to make sure that the son would not be harmed. Dear brothers and sisters, even though we can't see Jesus right beside us in our trials, you and I, we can be confident that he is there. Verses 1 and 2, David is complaining. Then three and four, we hear him praying. And in verses five and six, he comes to the point of trusting and rejoicing. David's eyes are no longer on himself. He is no longer dwelling in the darkness, but he's counting his blessings, the blessing from the past and the blessings of the present. The wonderful writer, C.S. Lewis, in a grief observed, wrote it like this. You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death. It is easy to say you believe a rope to be strong as long as you are merely using it to cord a box. But suppose you had to hang by that rope over a precipice. Wouldn't you then first discover how much you really trusted it? David was willing to put his faith into action, to put his belief into practice and discover God to be loving, faithful and good. Leslie Brand, another writer in our days, in a book called Psalms Now, used the, the chapter 13 in today's language as she writes it like this. O oh God, sometimes you seem so far away. I cannot in this moment sense your presence or feel your power. The darkness enveloping me is stifling. This depression is suffocating. How long, O oh God, do I have to live in this void? O oh God, how long? Break into this black night, O oh God. Fill in this vast emptiness. Enter into my conflict, lest I fall, never to rise again. I continue to trust in your ever-present love. I shall again discover true joy in my relationship with you. Dear friends, may we continue to dream and hope as we travel together through this new year. And never forget our dear Lord's always ever present love and his warm embrace. May you and I be encouraged and comforted by that. Amen. Well, amen to that message. I hope you've been encouraged today. I hope your heart has been lifted. If you came, in watching this service with your heart burdened and heavy. I hope it's been lifted. If you came feeling sad, I hope joy has filled your heart. If you felt apprehensive about where God is leading you in the future, I hope God has spoken to you today and may his word continue to remain and abide with you. And so we thank God for this wonderful worship time. Let us now close as we pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you are a God that can bring change and you can bring deliverance to our hearts and you can turn things around when it seems as though there is no way out. You always have a way out. And we lift you up and high and we praise you, Lord, for the God that you are to know that there is nothing too hard for you. 
We commit ourselves to you now as we enter this untold week. May you go before us and may we abide and remain with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us once again. We look forward to having you next Sabbath. Let us join now as we sing our closing hymn together. <laughs>